you'll hear a conversation between an international student and the accommodation department. You have 30 seconds to look at questions 1 to 3. Hello, Accommodation Department. How can I help you? Uh, do you look after accommodation for international students? Yes, uh, we look after accommodation for all the students. Good. I hope you can help me then. I've only just been accepted onto a postgraduate course and I want to know if there is any accommodation available from this September. I know it's very short notice. Mm, yes, uh, it, it is rather late, but I'm sure we'll be able to find you something. Uh, first of all, can you give me your name and student number so that I can find you on the system? Sure. My name is Maria Teresa Gonzalez. Maria Teresa Gonzalez. Uh, how do you spell that? G-O-N-Z-A-L-E-Z. -E Thank you. Got it. And your student number, please? S H U three zero zero. 715PG SHU 300715PG Ah, here you are. Department of Modern Languages. Yes, that's me. You now have 30 seconds to look at questions 4 to 10. OK, now there are several options for postgraduate students. Firstly, there is the Trigon. Uh, this is a new block near to the station and not far from the main campus. Accommodation is what we call cluster accommodation. What does that mean? Uh, there's a small group of rooms, usually six, each with its own bathroom clustered around a lounge kitchen area which is shared. Oh, I see. That sounds good. They are very popular. Uh, the price for these is £99 per week, and we do have some availability left. However, for postgraduate students, there are other options. And what are they? Uh, there's another apartment block called The Cube, located near the west gate of the campus. Accommodation there is in one or two bedroom self-contained flats. So, the cube is self-contained? How does that work? Well, basically, they're just like ordinary apartments. Each apartment has one or two study bedrooms with ensuite bathroom, a lounge and a kitchen. And what is the price of those? Uh, for the one bedroom, it is £180 per week. And for the two bedroom, it is £110 per week for each person. And can I choose who I share with? If you have a friend and you would like to share with them, of course, we can reserve a two-bedroom apartment for you both. Otherwise, you just have to share with whoever else is there. Uh, obviously, it will be another woman. Hmm. I will have to think about this. Do I have to make a decision now? No, but we don't have much accommodation left, so I can't guarantee that there will still be availability if you leave it too long. Yes, that's fair. I have a friend in the management department who might like to share. I will speak with her and get back to you this afternoon. OK, fine. Uh, do let us know as soon as you can. I will do. Thanks for all your help. My pleasure. Bye. Bye. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Now turns to part two. Part two. Zoe goes to talk to her academic advisor. First, look at questions eleven to fourteen. Listen carefully. How are you getting on, Zoe? Feeling at home yet?、Mm, well, more or less. There are still some things I need to buy, and I haven't found my way to all the facilities yet. But I really love the campus, and I've already made a few friends. Fantastic. Now let's see what we can do to get your studies off to the right start too. You're on the foundation course, so you can take up to eight modules. What we advise is that you take four modules in the first semester, and assuming everything goes well, four in the second. Have you decided which you want to take in this semester? I haven't made my mind up yet. I can't decide whether to take Principles of Marketing or Introduction to International Trade. Well, that depends on your career goal. You're planning to work in the biotechnology sector, aren't you? Uh, well, that's my present thinking, but I guess I might change my mind. Right. Well, marketing is a broad, general subject that you will find really useful in a number of careers. International trade, on the other hand, is more specific. That's fine if you're sure it's the sort of work you want to do. A lot of students start off thinking about that option because it seems glamorous, but marketing can also be an exciting career, and there's a wide choice of jobs. Maybe you ought to wait until your career ideas are a bit more definite before you go down that road. Yes, I see. I could take international trade next year, couldn't I? Sure, you could do international finance as well. So, in your first semester, you've got principles of marketing. Introduction to economics, banking, and finance, and let's see, principles of financial accounting. How do you feel about that as a package? It's okay, I think. Before the broadcast continues, look at questions fifteen to twenty. You will now listen to the second part of the talk. But I'm a bit worried about the maths. There'll be some statistics to do, won't there? Basic statistics, yes, but nothing more difficult than your last year of school maths. I know, but our maths syllabus was a bit old-fashioned. Mostly algebra, geometry, trigonometry, and stuff. Hardly any stats. Right. Well, it sounds as if you could do with the maths brush-up course. Can I arrange for you to attend just the classes on statistics, if you like? That'd be great. I didn't want to do the whole of maths again, but the stats classes would make me feel much more confident. Thanks. Hang on a minute. There's one more thing. Your English. Now you know you have to reach a satisfactory standard in English by the end of your first year to be allowed to go on to the main BSc course. Yeah. Now I'm in an English-speaking environment, and I have to speak English all the time. I'm sure I'll be all right. It certainly helps, but speaking isn't everything. You'll have to get your reading up to the standards where you can understand the books on your course reading list quickly. To get the information and ideas, you need to write your essays. That means you have to develop a high level of comprehension skills. You'll never get through the course material. If you try to read the books intensively from cover to cover, that's why our language skills development program gives you a series of graded academic texts to study and answer questions on a limited time. You'll probably find it hard at first, having to work against the clock without a dictionary. How can I improve my skimming and scanning skills? Good question. For that, you'll have to do a range of specially designed exercises. 
Sometimes these will be from a transparency because it is often how the lecture material is presented. Sometimes I think I'll never learn all the vocabulary. English is such an enormous language. I know what you mean. English is the biggest language ever. At least three hundred and fifty thousand words. Even Winston Churchill only knew sixty thousand, so they say. But as an academic student, you can get a lot of help from the academic word list by Avril Coxhead, of Victoria University. That's in Wellington, New Zealand. I've studied word lists, of course. But how does this one help? The academic word list is based on a survey of three and a half million words of academic text. It contains five hundred and seventy families of the words most commonly found in academic texts. Well. That's apart from the two thousand most useful words in English. They come in a separate list. You can see copies of both in the library. You said word families. Do you mean words that are similar? In a way, yes. It means that all the different grammatical forms of a word are listed together. So you can see the nouns, verbs, adjectives, forms with prefixes and suffixes, and so forth. It'll be clearer when you look at it. Anyway, Avril Coxhead gives you really great hints about how to learn the words. So it shouldn't be too daunting. The trouble is, I tend to forget the words I learn. Well, there are two ways you can tackle that. First, always try to learn the words in a context. Either learn a whole sentence using a word, or learn a phrase that the word typically comes in. We call phrases like that collocations. That's a new one on me. Collocations. I'd better make a note of it. You do that. You can find collocations in most modern dictionaries. Anyway. As I was saying, there's a second study aid I recommend for vocabulary learning. When you get an assignment, take a sheet of paper and write four headings: words I can use, words I can recognise but can't use, words I'm not sure of, words I don't know. Don't bother with the simple words, of course. Then go back after two weeks and look at the list again. Can you move any of the words into a better column? That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. You will hear a conversation about tea between an expert and a reporter. You have thirty seconds to look at questions twenty-one to twenty-four. Hi, Jacob. Thank you so much for coming along today. It's my pleasure. I'm very intrigued about what a tea meditation entails exactly. Well, it's very simple, really. I think the first thing you need to keep in mind is that it is mostly about leaving everything that you have been thinking or worrying about today to one side. Really focus on the present moment. Well, it sounds great. I certainly don't know very much about tea, and I'm keen to get started. But before you go into more detail. Can I ask you what your favourite kind of tea is? Well, I think the kind of tea we are going to have today is my favourite. It is pu'er tea from Yunnan Province in southern China. What makes this tea special? Pu'er is a dark tea. The regions of Yunnan, the north of Vietnam and Laos, have one of the best climates for growing tea in the world. Pu'er is a post-fermented tea. Oh, what is a post-fermented tea exactly? It is a tea that has undergone a period of aging in the open air. They age the tea for days, even years. 
The exposure to humidity and oxygen help to oxidize the tea leaves and encourage fermentation. This changes the smell of the tea and also removes a lot of bitterness from the taste. It sounds similar to the process of aging wine. The process is different, but the effect of aging on the taste is certainly similar. Does this mean the tea can be quite expensive? Absolutely, it can be very expensive. The tea is usually pressed into balls or cakes and sold. At one time, only tea enthusiasts cared about buying these cakes, but now many people have realised that they are an investment, and so buy them like they would buy gold because the price goes up a lot over time. You now have thirty seconds to look at questions twenty-five to twenty-six. So now I want you to focus on clearing your mind of anything other than this present moment. Let go of any concerns. Okay,、uh, one slight problem. I will need to record our conversation, and I will need to take notes for the article.、Uh, I plan to write about this for my newspaper.、Uh, is that okay? Oh yes, of course. Whatever you need. Thank you. I'll try to keep my notes to a minimum. Good. So. Where was I? Oh yes, I think very few people really appreciate the complexity and variety of tea that exists in the world. Right, most people are maybe like me and just use tea bags. Exactly, and with a tea bag, the tea is trapped inside and cannot move around freely. You can really taste the difference drinking a brewed tea that was free to move around through all the water. So, do you ever use tea bags? Never. You now have thirty seconds to look at questions twenty-seven to thirty. There are many different kinds of tea: white, yellow, black, green, oolong, matcha, herbal, and many others. Each one has its own unique properties. To fully experience what each tea has to offer, you must brew it in the correct way. I also believe in only drinking tea that is picked and sorted by hand, rather than using mechanical processes. Although it takes more time, the tea made by hand is so much better that it leads to an increase in the tea sales. But in that case, surely if there is more interest in the tea, and with the time-intensive farming process, this means there could be shortages because the demand is higher than the ability to produce it. There were shortages for a while, but then an artificial fermentation process was developed in the 1970s, which helped to speed up the fermentation times. As I mentioned, this process has an aging effect on the taste of pu'er tea that is very similar to the effect on the taste of wine that you get from that fermentation process. Though for pu'er tea today, we are talking about that artificial process. How can they do this artificially? The farmers gather the tea leaves into a big pile, then cover it with a large sheet or tarp. They spray water on the tea every now and then, and therefore fermentation happens faster. Usually, the tea is left for thirty, forty-five, sixty, or even ninety days. Still, the farmer will check the tea every few days, and just by the feel of the tea, he knows whether it is ready or if it needs more time. Wow. That sounds like a fascinating process. I never realised that there was such a science behind producing tea. Well, now you are ready for the best part: the tasting of it. That sounds like a very good idea to me. So what I will do now is boil the water, and we can begin our meditation. What does that entail? 
We need to focus on only two things. The first is your mind and body. Forget everything that you have been worrying about today. Forget about what you have to do later on, or what somebody said to you earlier. Focus on your breathing and on how your body feels. If you have aches and pains, acknowledge them. Pinpoint where there is tension in your body and try to release it. Oh yes, I can really feel tension in my shoulders. Let it go. Close your eyes if that helps. Take deep breaths in, and out. Soon we will drink the tea. When you drink it, think about the taste and how it feels on your tongue. Is it easy to swallow the tea, or do you need to gulp it? Can you brew the tea leaves more than once? Oh yes, you can brew some teas more than ten times. Now we will shift to noble silence, focusing only on ourselves and the tea. Enjoy. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part four. Part four. You will hear a talk about the pitfalls and pleasures of being a postgraduate student. Look at questions thirty-two to thirty-seven. Postgraduates are about as easy to define as catching steam in a bucket. Courses can be vocational, for training, as research, as a preparation for research, or a combination of these. Also, you can choose between full-time and part-time. Increasingly, the approach to postgraduate study is becoming modular. The vast majority of postgraduates are doing short, taught courses. Many of which provide specific vocational training. Indeed, there has been a 400% increase in postgraduate numbers in Britain over the past 20 years. Current figures stand at just under 400,000. People undertake postgraduate study for many reasons. These may be academic, intellectual challenge, development of knowledge, vocational, training for a specific career goal, or only vague. Drifting into further study. It is essential that you determine the reasons you want to become a postgraduate. If you have clear goals and reasons for studying, this will enhance your learning experience and help you to remain focused and motivated throughout your course. Where you study should be based on much more than the course you want to do. For some courses, you're likely to be there for several years. And it is important that you are happy living there. Check also what type of accommodation is available, and whether the institution provides any housing specifically for postgraduates. Choosing an institution and department is a difficult process. To determine quality, do not rely on the reputation of an institution, but find out what the ratings are from the most recent assessment exercises. Find out about the staff. Their reputation, competence, enthusiasm, and friendliness. Visit the department if possible, and talk to existing postgraduates about their experience, satisfaction, comments, and complaints. Be very careful to check how they feel about their supervisors. Also, check what facilities are available, both at an institutional level, for example, libraries, 
laboratory and computing facilities, and in the department, for example, study room, desk, photocopying, secretarial support, etc. Everyone will have their own priorities here. I am always anxious to check the computer support available and regard it as slightly more important than library access. Your working environment and the support available to you plays an essential part in making your work as a postgraduate a positive experience. Life as a postgraduate can be very different to your other experiences of education. Things that can distinguish your experience are the level of study, independence of working, intensity of the course, the demands on your time, and often the fact that you're older than the majority of students. These factors can contribute to making you feel isolated. However, there are several ways you can make sure that this is either short-lived or does not happen at all. Many student unions have postgraduate societies that organize social events and may also provide representation for postgraduates to both the student union and the institution. Departments can also help to create a sense of identity and community and often have discussion groups available. Don't be afraid to talk to staff about any difficulties you might be having. Of course universities provide counselling services but we have found that the best advice comes from talking to other postgraduates who may have faced similar difficulties. Look at questions 38 to 40. Financial planning is essential since the government excludes postgraduates from student loans and it can be difficult to maintain your student status with banks. This has implications for free banking and overdraft facilities. Do not underestimate your living costs including food, accommodation and travel and be careful not to budget for everything except a social life. Funding a course is one of the most challenging things people face when considering postgraduate study. Most postgraduate students finance themselves. They pay often very large fees to the institution and receive no maintenance income to support their study. Make sure you know exactly what your costs will be. Institutions often hide extra fees, like laboratory costs, behind the headline fee rate advertised. Funding can come from various sources research councils, charities, trust funds, institutional scholarships, local education authorities and professional bodies and organizations all offer various levels of funding. As I said before, the government excludes postgraduates from student loans, so it is essential you look to other sources. Career development loans are available from high street banks. The best advice on funding is to be proactive, persistent and patient. The postgraduate community in Britain is multinational, has a wide range of experience of life and work and an exciting mix of goals, both career and academic. Being a postgraduate student should be a productive and fulfilling thing to do and you will become part of a diverse and motivated social group. That is the end of part four. You now have half a.